Dr. Victoria, let's talk about the benefits of flossing. We always hear from our dentists, we need to floss. You should floss every day. How many times a day should we be flossing? What should we be using to flossing, uh, for flossing? But what are the actual benefits? Let, let's start there. Okay. Um, so where do I start with flossing? So um, the most important reason for flossing is because 30% uh, of the bacteria in your mouth is actually in between your teeth. So if you're not flossing and you're brushing like a superstar, you're actually only ever doing 70% of the job. Um, right. So in terms of how many times to floss, I would, I always recommend everyone to floss twice a day. So in my eyes, you should be flossing um, at the same time that you're brushing. Um, and the reason for that is because I just feel like it's quite difficult to tell people like, okay, like floss, you know, once every three days, because it's, when do you choose that time to floss? So um, it's better to just, every time you pick up your toothbrush, you also pick up your floss. Um, and that way you're always getting that hundred percent kind of efficacy and getting rid of all that bacteria. Uh, what else was, oh, what floss do I like? Let me show you. I've got, so this is satin tape. Uh -huh. satin <laughs> I may or may tape. not be gotcha. in my dental surgery. <laughs> um, everyone's got their, you know, their preferences. I have not been plugged by Oral-B to say this. Um, but the reason I like a tape over a string is because tape basically slides really smoothly um, around the teeth, whereas the string can sometimes actually aggravate the gums a little bit um, and kind of actually, yeah, just kind of saw them and hurt them. So the tape is a little mm. bit more forgiving. Um, and I think that it's really important for people to understand how to floss. Um, mm -hmm. So I always teach everyone how to floss no matter who they are. <laughs> And the reason being is that it, everyone does it wrong. So it's not just about going kind of click clack and inside and outside of the tooth. That's not enough. You actually want to go in and slide around the tooth and make kind of a C shape, if that makes sense. Um, and that way you're getting rid of all that bacteria on either side of that gum. And so with just, just on the satin tape uh, stuff, because I struggle to get the floss, particularly at the back of my teeth. And that's my excuse yeah. as to why, like I haven't done a very good job, as you told me uh, during our consultation <laughs> a couple of months ago of, of getting uh, all the bacteria and all the plaque around there. Are there other implements that, w that you would recommend for people like me who can't get the satin right at the back of their, their, um, their teeth? Yes, so you've got definitely, um, so for example, you can use like a little harp. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's like floss picks like with harp. Um, so you can use that. That one basically allows you to get in between those very back teeth. Um, and it, yeah, it looks like a little saw and you can get there. I don't prefer that for front teeth because I think that you don't have the same kind of control and dexterity as you would do with the string. So generally I say still use the string on all the teeth that you can and the teeth that you can't get to at the very back, you can use one of those little floss pick kind of harps mm -hmm. and just get in between there. And then for people who maybe have larger gaps in between their teeth or they can't, you know, they, they're flossing, but their dentist or their hygienist keeps on saying, well, you're not flossing well enough or there's still lots of tartar built up. Um, you can start to think about interdental brushes um so here i have <laughs> your tv brushes um you've got different colors depending yeah. on the size of the space um and what you want to basically remove um and so your hygienist or dentist should tell you what color is right for you but sometimes that's a better alternative to floss for someone who has a massive gap and that floss is just going to swim in that gap it's not going to do anything so you might need a little bit of uh, an interdental brush instead yeah, as we'll come to, because I've got quite bad receding gums, I have to use those interdental brushes myself because the gaps are pretty big. Is there any evidence to say that if you floss or you use those brushes that you can exacerbate any gaps or any damage to the gums? Yes. So if you're, um, yeah, if you're flossing really aggressively or you're using the string um, and not correctly, then you can get um, kind of like, it's kind of like lacerations in the gum, basically. Mm. Um, and that's just you literally just like cutting into your gums, 
or if you're using a TP brush, which is too large for the gap and you're just ramming it in there, then actually over time, you can um, destroy the gum. Um, you can also even sometimes create more space in between the teeth. And that's why you want like a nice friction in between the teeth with the TP brushes. You want that, you want to feel it on both sides of the tooth, but it shouldn't feel as if you have to ram it in there or it shouldn't hurt you. Um, and that's mm. why having a dental professional tell you which size and color to go for would be quite good. Okay. And um, we'll get onto this in a bit, but, but I guess, you know, if you start flossing for the first time and perhaps you're not used to flossing, is it expected that you might get a bit of bleeding or is any case of bleeding when flossing or using the interdental brushes something that signals uh, a, a gum disease? Um, I think, yeah, if it's like the first time that you flossed, you're going to make a few mistakes. You might, you know, hurt your gums a little bit a few times and, and that's fine. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have raging gum disease. Um, however, generally, I would say that if you do get lots of bleeding on flossing, then you should definitely seek professional help. And also more importantly, I think any time, if ever you spit into your basin and you see blood in your saliva, after brushing or anything like that, that's a really big telltale that you've got inflammation and you need to go um, and get probably a hygiene. Okay. Let's, let's zoom in into flossing in a bit more detail. So you said that 30% of the bacteria lies in between the teeth. That's why flossing is super important, um, which, you know, for me is a, a stark difference already. Like if you're, if you're br just brushing your teeth, there's still like a third of your mouth that you're not getting to. What are the specific benefits of flossing that you can uh, we can attribute to uh, this practice every day? Um, so I think the, the biggest one is obviously um, if you're like you said, if you're not flossing, you're only doing 70 percent of the job. And uh, the important thing is to try and clear all of that bacteria and plaque and, and food away from your mouth every day. Um, and the reason for that is because most of the time, if you're not clearing the food in between your teeth, then you're increasing your risk of decay, um, of also gum disease as well. And those, it's because that food and bacteria can just sit there stagnant for often, you know, days, weeks, months, and then that starts to eat away at the tooth or sometimes at the gums as well. And that's where we get local diseases um, that dentists would be able to pick up on. Um, but then also there has been a lot of evidence to show that actually not necessarily just flossing, but regular clearance of bacteria and food and et cetera from the mouth and not having inflammation in your mouth um, has a beneficial impact on general health um, and reducing general inflammation as well. To talk a bit more about the, that general health and the general inflammation piece actually with, with flossing uh, specifically, because uh, we, we've talked a bit about inflammation in the mouth and how that relates to uh, heart disease in, in the past. But I think specifically when it comes to flossing, people are interested in this idea around reducing inflammation in the mouth as well. Is that something that we can attribute to flossing? Um, yeah, so actually the New York Times came out with an article uh, a few months ago and it was the headline was like flossing can save your life and um, floss twice a day to um, reduce your risk of Alzheimer's and um, I mean, it was a pretty strong headline, <laughs> yeah. um, and, but <laughs> it was like, whoa, um, but at the same time, it definitely, I think, made people think of flossing as a more important thing, not just something that us dentists like to nag you about. You know, there's a reason we're saying it. It's not because we just like to be annoying. Um, <laughs> and with that article um, for with the New York Times, what they were basically showing was that um, if you have lots of bacteria um, kind of collecting in your mouth and particularly in between uh, your teeth and around your gums, then um, that can basically increase your inflammation in your mouth and your mouth is very close to your brain. And so actually that inflammation can travel upwards to the brain um, and cause uh, problems in the brain and inflammation. Um, but also what they found was that uh, patients who had severe gum disease were at a 70% increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And they were finding mm. specific oral bacteria 
um, in the uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid of Alzheimer's sufferers. And this was bacteria that only really ever um, is found in the mouth. Um, oh, wow. And so again, that further confirmed that, you know, I feel like with Alzheimer's, it's one of those diseases which as a society, we're all quite scared of, but we also know very little about because no one truly can can explain the cause of it or how to reduce the risk of it. And so if something as simple as flossing um, and brushing your teeth well could improve that then um, and reduce your risk, then it's definitely a no-brainer to, to do that. How, how convinced are you um, looking at the association between people who have gum disease and something like Alzheimer's dementia uh, combined with the potential bacteria involved, the causative organism found in the mouth and also found in the cerebrospinal fluid as a clear indication that the two are actually causative, uh, causally linked? Um, are you convinced that, that there is certainly something to be explored further there or are you still sort of uh, on the fence but taking a precautionary approach? I think that's a really interesting question because you're right. I think uh, a lot of the times we can make big claims about um, two things when actually they're not causative and it's just correlation or, you know, by chance. Um, with the Alzheimer's and the gum disease, um, I've been looking into it a lot because I was on the fence and I thought, oh, like it's quite a strong claim to be making. Um, and generally, I would say most of the research has been more of a um, kind of coincidence or a correlation between the two. But there have been some studies which have actually looked into the mechanisms behind how oral bacteria could cause problems in the brain. And what they found was that uh, a certain oral bacteria called uh, Porphyrmonas gingivalis, which is elevated in patients who suffer from gum disease, um, it releases a certain toxic enzyme called gingipanes. And these gingipanes are able to travel through the blood um, up to the brain and those gingipanes basically um, are enzymes which can break down um, your your brain tissue um, and patients who have Alzheimer's have significantly high levels of gingipanes. So I think mm -hmm. that is one of the main arguments which actually shows that there's a causative element to this um, and it's definitely not something to be kind of disregarded. Um, but I'm still very much still kind of on the fence um, and with all my patients I still tell them all of this evidence and I say look worst comes to absolute worst there's no causative kind of thing between the two of them I just made you floss twice a day that's it <laughs> you know what I, mean? and I don't believe that yeah. but worst comes to worst and they say okay there's no correlation at least you don't have gum disease and you don't have decay and you've reduced your risk of inflammation so you know yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't actually read that New York Times article about flossing and Alzheimer's, but like, did they uh, speak to any studies that showed like a massive reduction in risk if you were to be in the cohort of people that would be flossing, say, once or twice a day? No, so that's what they hadn't looked at was they looked at patients who had Alzheimer's and whether they had gum disease, but I think the next step would be also to see whether or not, like you said, if someone was healthy, whether there was a reduction in risk of Alzheimer's, but also maybe if a patient had very early onset Alzheimer's, if being able to manage their oral microbiome and improve their oral health and, for example, eradicate that porphyrmonas gingivalis in the mouth, whether that would have a direct impact on the patient's Alzheimer's progression. Is is this like a test that's like almost um, commercially available to look at? Uh, what, what do you call them? Ginger peens? Is that is that what it is? Ginger peens. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so there isn't at the moment. I have not seen anything to show um, for you to be able to measure the level of ginger peens in your cerebrospinal fluid or in your brain. But what I do is I go back a few steps and I look at levels of porphyrmonas gingivalis in the mouth and um and we do oral microbiome testing and then we basically if patients have high levels of p gingivalis maybe combined with having a family history of alzheimer's um then we go quite aggressive on making sure there's absolutely no porphyrmonas gingivalis in the microbiome 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so important. I think like this as a combined approach um, would definitely be the way to go because I, I think, and this is a result of headlines like the New York Times where you, you have like flossing and the association with Alzheimer's is like almost uh, framed as the sole causative organism or the sole causative reason. Whereas in reality, something like Alzheimer's is so multifactorial. You have exercise, you have sugar, you have toxic exposure, you have yeah. mold, you have all these different things. So definitely paying more attention to our dental health is part of the part of the solution, but not the the the, the full solution. Um, so is, is there any way to determine uh, l- whether flossing or not flossing lowers your life expectancy? Or is, is, there, is that a thing? Or is that is that something that is still sort of um, hearsay? I think it's, it's similar to what you said that, you know, life expectancy and all of that, it's all multifactorial. And mm. um, I will definitely be the first to say that oral health has a massive contribution to quality of life, to um, life expectancy, to general inflammation, risk of other diseases, for sure. But I don't think I, I, I haven't seen a paper as of yet to say that, you know, brushing is going to um, improve your life expectancy by 4.25 years. But I wish that would make my job very easy. <laughs> but um, at the moment, no. Uh, uh, and in the similar vein, like flossing and Alzheimer's and this potential mechanism, super, super interesting. I, I, I love hearing about these studies. Are there any other associations that you've come across in in the literature between flossing and and other uh, quite major conditions? Um, Again, I wouldn't say it's specific to flossing, but it's more to do with kind of maybe gum disease um, or having lots of bacteria and plaque in your mouth. But there's a lot of associations. Um, So, I mean, things I think we've spoken about this before, but, you know, things like heart disease, high blood pressure, infertility, um one that i'm quite interested in at the moment is chronic kidney um disease um oh, right. and how patients who have uh yeah so actually what they found recently is that we know that diabetes um can really exacerbate your chronic kidney disease and um and is a very high risk for having chronic kidney disease but what recent research has found is that actually gum disease has the same impact as diabetes does to chronic kidney disease. So, um, which is pretty wild. Um, mm. We also know the association of diabetes and gum disease um, and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so there's a lot of them coming out. And I think right now it's an incredible time to be in our profession because we're starting to see that, um, you know, dentistry is not just about drill and fill, but actually um, improving oral health with the aim of contributing to general health. Um, and how important it is to have a good mouth. Are there other other, uh, organisms that you find, and we're not specifically just speaking about bacteria, even though that's that's largely uh, what what we look at with with a lot of these different tests. Are there other examples of organisms that you find in the mouth that are exclusively found in the mouth that you find in other parts of the body during the course of uh, disease in the same way that you described the, the Alzheimer's connection? Um, yes, definitely. So I think with, with the oral and gut microbiome, um, they're pretty much extensions of each other. So often um, patients can swallow their oral bacteria and there are a few which are acid resistant. So that means that they can travel down and actually sit in your gut and, and chill and, and grow and cause problems. So one of them, again, is Porphyromonas gingivalis. Um, so you can see sometimes that translocation of bacteria going downwards. Um, also, for example, with, um, what else, infective endocarditis. So that's basically patients who have maybe a faulty heart valve, um, and bacteria from their mouth travels through their blood and essentially sticks onto, um, their faulty heart valve, um, and can cause, um, fatality actually can cause death. It can Mm. cause a lot of very big problems. And that's why patients who have any sort of heart surgery or faulty heart valves need to be very hot on their oral hygiene and make sure they never have any oral infections. Um, But yeah, the list goes on. You can have a lot of them. And and I think 
what people sometimes forget is that the mouth is the gateway to the rest of the body. So everything that you you swallow, you breathe, um, it's coming into your mouth first and then traveling elsewhere. And so you need to make sure that your mouth is um, healthy enough to be able to fight off a lot of those viruses and that bacteria and, and become a strong barrier against kind of traveling further down into the body. Um, and also obviously making sure you don't have a high load of bacteria or problems in the mouth. Yeah. Sorry, I'm shooting from the hip here. So forgive me because I haven't uh, pre-warned you that I was going to ask you about antibiotic uh, use and its impact on the oral microbiota. But when you were just talking about the gut there, I was just thinking about overuse of antibiotics, uh, particularly in patients who have got uh, heart valves and we want to take quite a proactive approach with ensuring that they don't get any infections whatsoever. And the overuse of antibiotics just generally leading to uh, susceptibility to other conditions, even things like autoimmune conditions. Um, do you see the same sorts of ramifications in the mouth uh, for people who are using antibiotics um, for whatever reason, whether it's because of recurrent UTIs or uh, recurrent skin infections, etc.? Do, do you see manifestations of that in, in their oral health? Yeah, so actually a lot of the time they will have quite a dysbiotic oral microbiome um and and that's just because antibiotics kind of obviously they're they're needed and um sometimes we we have to take them and they've saved many people's lives but um what antibiotics can do uh, i kind of call them like a nuclear bomb they can just come and they just like get rid of all of the bacteria and they um sometimes that's needed um but one of the consequences is that sometimes other bacteria are able to grow in that environment and become like the first early colonizers and start growing and multiplying. Maybe you don't want that bad bacteria in your uh, mouth or in your gut. Um, so it's quite important in my opinion that if you are taking antibiotics that you're taking pre and probiotics as well. So you're trying to kind of guide the microbiome after the, the detonation of your atomic bomb of antibiotics that you're guiding it into having good bacteria uh, recolonizing and and becoming those early colonizers um, in terms of you're right the susceptibility to maybe other bacterial infections is it is quite worrying and I think um, I do prescribe antibiotics relatively kind of regularly um, but what I do do is I do oral microbiome testing to then see what might you know what antibiotic would be be best for that patient um, and sometimes we might do a shorter course or depending on the kind of quantity of the bacteria and also what type of bacteria are there. And I think one of the biggest problems in our society is that we're kind of just throwing antibiotics out, but we're, we're throwing out broad spectrum ones for prevention of diseases, as opposed to actually seeing what the cause of that problem is and then prescribing the right antibiotic for that infection. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And I think that's testament to like how forward thinking uh, you and your the clinic are. Um, let's, uh, let's shift gears and talk about uh, an issue that's close to my heart, which is proceeding gums. Uh, <laughs> can, can we, I know we can't reverse receding gums, um, but how do we slow down? Well, why don't we talk about what, what, we're seeding gums are first, um, and, uh, and, and, and why this might happen, uh, uh, in and of itself. Yeah. So basically receded gums are, um, essentially where your gum starts to drop. So you have more tooth exposed and, um, less gum. And it is a very, very, very common, um, problem that people suffer from. And it's one of those kind of frustrating things because, you can brush really well and eat really well and you have no dental disease, but you can still have dental pain because of your recession. Um, yeah. And there's a couple of calls. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I, I feel that. <laughs> um, so there's a, a couple of causes of recession and some of them. So the first one is overzealous brushing. So that's the idea that you're basically just brushing really aggressively um and essentially you're brushing away your gums um and the problem is is that your gums don't grow back so unlike a lot of the other parts of the body where you know if you if you grazed your your hand your skin would grow back or anything like that your gums don't 
Um, so overzealous brushing is the first one. Um, and I would say the way to combat that is by brushing with an electric toothbrush, which has a pressure sensor. Um, and that way you should, you know, you can see when you're brushing too hard, nine times out of 10, most patients are brushing way too hard and, and they think they're doing a good job. They're like, great, the harder I brush, the better I'm brushing, which is not the case. Um, and you're brushing away your gum. So definitely go get a pressure sensored electric toothbrush look at the mirror and brush for two minutes. Don't walk around whilst you're doing the ironing and you know putting your stuff away. You know, devote it to yourself and sit and look and you'll be surprised at how often you're brushing way too hard. Um, another thing is toothpaste. So um, making sure that you're trying to use a non-abrasive toothpaste. Um, so anything which has like little granules or is a bit crunchy, I generally like, I, I avoid those. You want something which is quite soothing to the gums um and is soft and that goes as well with trying to find a toothpaste which doesn't have um lots of essential oils in it um or sodium lauryl sulfate so those are all things which can actually be quite aggressive to your gums and i kind of compare it if you were to get like a peppermint essential oil and very strong concentrated and you put it on your skin your skin would burn mm. right so why is it that we're we're all okay with with brushing with essential oils in our gums which are so tender and sensitive um so yeah so that's number one number two that's a really good be, point i don't um, think i've ever thought about that because a lot of the sort of quote-unquote natural toothpaste are using cinnamon and ginger and and fennel yeah. essential oils and the sort of uh heuristic is oh well it's a natural product that that will be fine but n the way you've just put it there that 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 makes total sense that it would be pretty uh pretty harsh yeah it is i don't know why people I have so many patients who are like oh yeah i'm just brushing with like i don't know like fennel mixed with like essential blah 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 and i'm like what are you doing like and i said to one of them like she literally had pure oil and she was putting on her toothbrush and brushing her oh, wow. teeth and yeah and then i was like put some of that on your skin right now and she was like no i, I wouldn't do that i'm not gonna burn myself and i was like <laughs> 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 right <laughs> so yeah <laughs> okay so no essential oils on the gums kids okay got gotcha right yes, yes. um what else? so number two is sometimes when you have gum disease um one of the side effects is recession of the gums so if your gums have been super puffy and you've had um you know a lot of infections and inflammation um, then once you've had your, your gum treatments um, and your gums have healed, sometimes when they kind of tighten around the tooth again, they actually recede. Um, and that's just an unfortunate side effect of, of having gum treatment. Um, it is definitely, you know, the, the better thing than suffering from gum disease, but it is a bit annoying for patients who maybe have had gum disease all their life and then they come, they finish and they're stabilized, but then they have sensitivity kind of moving forwards. Um, mm. And then the third is just kind of a, a genetic predisposition. So, you mm. know, we all have different skin, we have different hair, we have everything, you know, is all a little bit different. And unfortunately, some people have very, very um, thin and kind of friable gums. And some people also have gums which don't attach to their teeth properly. So they're kind of a bit like flappy. And uh, those are patients who unfortunately, if they brush a little bit too hard or if they have a tiny bit of gum disease or even just you know anything they are at a much higher risk of having that recession and that's unfortunately just a, a genetic thing that that happens um and that moves on to actually the last one which is also sometimes genetic is basically if you were to chop your your mouth in half okay and then you were to look at your your <laughs> um your jaw but from like a bird's eye view okay um do I have any model? Ah, i do here's a 101 guys on dentistry okay <laughs> if you're so, if you're listening you, to this you, you want to watch on youtube to oh. see what dr victoria is doing but yeah no we can you can explain it okay so i'll also try and explain it too so for anyone who's listening but okay let's go for the top job so you are looking at your jaw from the bird's eye view 
And basically, um, you have something called a bony envelope. And what that is, is basically the bone that all of your teeth are encased into. And sometimes, some patients, unfortunately, or genetically, um, their teeth lay a little bit outside of the bony envelope. So again, mm -hmm. imagine if you're watching, you've got this U shape. Imagine if this tooth was just out here, right? Mm -hmm. Then that means that that tooth has a lot less support than the other surrounding teeth. And that means that the only thing that's holding it in is that gum and that gum will wear away with time. Um, unfortunately, it's not always genetic. It can also be caused. So a lot of people who have orthodontic treatment and maybe aren't kind of working with the right dentist or orthodontist, um, sometimes one of the things that we do is we expand the teeth. So we move the teeth so that people have toothy smiles and you can see more teeth but one of the side effects of that can be sometimes that the tooth is outside of that bony envelope and again there's now no bone kind of covering the outside of those mm. teeth and the only thing that's holding them in is that gum and that gum it's it's like a little thin piece of tissue so of course it's gonna it's going to kind of grind away there we go guys <laughs> that so i actually counted five things there right so there's uh, or potentially six if you want to separate the genes so brushing too hard there's uh yeah. what you put on the teeth so sls essential oils other abrasive uh, materials yeah. that you find there's uh, previous infections so uh gum disease that would leave your uh your your uh, remaining gums um uh more more um uh, vulnerable uh you've got the genetic component of just having gums that are a little bit weaker there's uh yeah. uh, another sort of what I, I i forget the name but you the way you described it with the u-shape and and the the actual bony prominence is really interesting uh, another genetic component and then orthodontic work as well um that could potentially expose yeah. that genetic predisposition um that, yeah. The orthodontic work is quite interesting because I've had orthodontic work uh, back in 2009 and that was preceding any sort of recessions. I'm not trying to call out my orthodontist here on the podcast, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting you said it because I do have like quite a big wild smile. And maybe maybe it sort of revealed the vulnerability in my, uh, in my genetics uh, by having that work. Yeah, yeah. Some I think uh, nowadays we're seeing a lot more of it than previously because it's. So my sister is an orthodontist, and that's why I know a, a lot more about this because what she was saying to me was that um, over the past kind of maybe twenty years or so or thirty years, um, orthodontists are tending to kind of expand the arches and try and and keep as many teeth as possible, but to have a really toothy smile, and that's just the trend that's in right now. And pr previously we used to take out teeth and close up the gaps. And now a lot of the time we're like, we can, you can keep all the teeth, don't worry about it. We keep all the teeth, but we spread everything out. And actually sometimes your jaw can't handle that. That's, yeah, that's so interesting. And with the genetic predisposition, uh, is there any rationale of actually looking for those SNPs using a, uh, a consumer uh, genetic test? And is there an association between that and maybe some other things that might be going uh, wrong in, in the body, like your uh, ability to recover from exercise or, or collagen uh, uh, production? Yeah, so what I'm starting to find, and I haven't actually seen any research um, published on this, but this is just what I'm seeing, is that patients who have a lot of recession usually have quite high levels of collagen breakdown. Um, and it makes sense because they're, your gums are made out of a type of collagen. And mm -hmm. so if you have high levels of collagen breakdown, that usually suggests you have some sorts of recession or gum disease. Um, and so in my clinic, we test for collagen breakdown. It's like a saliva test and um, it's a specific enzyme that causes that breakdown. And what I'm finding is that those patients have high levels of collagen breakdown and maybe their, their oral immunity is a little less than average. Um, but at the moment, I don't know of any kind of genetic tests, so to say, which would show you to be at an increased risk of recession. Gotcha. Okay. That's, that's super interesting. I'm chatting to a consumer genetic test, uh, company and, uh, the founder has got a PhD in 
genomics and um uh, I'll, I'll pose that to her, to her actually i think she she might be able to find some answers and i'll share that with you um yeah, okay so as someone yeah i will do for sure as someone who suffers from receding gums are there any ways to slow down the 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 process of uh recession um okay so the electric toothbrush with the pressure sensor, yes. Yeah. Um, the toothpaste being non-abrasive and like free of essential oils and all of that. Um, otherwise, in terms of I'm, I'm supplements, I actually do encourage some supplementation. Um, so I'm a big fan of CoQ10. Um, so that's coenzyme Q10. And uh, the reason being is that um, part of the reason of gum disease is oxidative stress but also CoQ10 can help with collagen production. And if your gums are made out of collagen, it can improve that too. Um, and there have been some super interesting studies which have been looking at CoQ10 and gum disease um, and basically reducing gum inflammation. Um, so I would recommend CoQ10 for sure. Um, what else? Is there a particular dose? Um, I think 100 milligrams is usually um, a good amount. And then the next step is to find a CoQ10 gel, which um, there have been a few, which I'm, I'm trying out at the moment. So like a gel that you can apply on your gums. Um, and you and that apply it topically. Help. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be super cool. So that's something I'm looking into at the moment. I think also what some, what I do sometimes for some patients is um, if they have really bad recession is um, we actually make them use a really soft toothbrush. So like, uh, so you have your electric toothbrush, you brush two minutes, and then you go over those areas of really severe recession with a very, very soft toothbrush. Um, and you just kind of massage gently. And that's just to make sure that you have absolutely no plaque and bacteria staying there. Because the problem is, is that it's kind of like a um, self perpetuating cycle because you have the gum recession. So then you're scared of brushing too hard in that area. So then you don't brush it. And then you get a collection of plaque and bacteria. And then that plaque and bacteria, it kind of irritates and disturbs the gum. And then the gum recedes even more. So mm. <laughs> it's, it is super frustrating, which is why that, that massaging of a really soft toothbrush um, around that area to make sure there's absolutely no plaque. And it would be maybe a little bit more comforting for you because it's such a soft toothbrush to go in that area and clean it like that. Yeah, that makes sort of sense. So brushing properly, using non-abrasive uh, products, CoQ10, hopefully a gel coming soon, watch the space. Um, what about uh, a protein deficiency? So, so when I talk about protein deficiency, I'm talking about dietary protein deficiency. Is there any association that you've noted in people who don't consume enough protein and uh, uh, the likelihood of, of, of gum recession? So I've actually been, yeah, I've been looking into this again, just with my own patients. Um, we make them do a full medical history, including their diet. Um, and my idea was to see whether or not um, certain diets like vegan or vegetarian or, or, or you know, um, carnivores would have any kind of um, cause or implementation or, you know, anything like that. But actually, I haven't seen anything. So there's not been any correlation between any of those to be honest with you which is kind of annoying because i wish that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know you just want to put your finger on it and be like oh that's it i can uh, i can advise this but, yeah. yeah okay beyond the general recommendations of ensuring protein adequacy um uh and uh, an anti-inflammatory diet i imagine that would have like general health benefits yes. anyway um, is, is there for any sure. rationale for collagen supplementation? And I'm aware there are multiple different types of collagen supplements out there, whether it be bovine, marine, vegan, but let's just lump them all into one for now. Would there be any sort of um, uh, benefit uh, in the same way that you've, you've seen with CoQ10 supplementation? I do also recommend collagen supplementation as well, like the powder form. Um, I think that, um, and I, I do recommend it to a lot of my patients just, just to use, especially if they have gum disease or recession, why not? Because your gums are made of collagen and you're right, it's a different type of collagen, um, but it definitely does still contribute. And then generally what I say for, for patients like 
overall oral health, I always say vitamin C, D, K2, um, and calcium. And mm. again, vitamin C um, is a pre precursor for collagen as well. So that helps with, with that side of things. Um, and having low vitamin C can actually cause a lot of problems with the gums too. Um, so those are like my general, every patient has that in their treatment plan. Like you should be taking these things. And that's why we also test for it now too. Um, mm. And the w crazy thing is, is that I would probably say like 90% of my patients have um, low vitamin D levels, lower than they should be. Um, wow. Yeah, and I I was like, I called the, the, pra the, the machine company up and I was like, there's something wrong with your machine. Everyone's <laughs> low in vitamin D. And he was like, you live in London, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, no, everyone's low in vitamin D. I was like, oh my God, yeah. It's really worrisome how, how low we all are. Yeah, yeah. It's because we spend a lot of time indoors and um, just not getting the adequate amount of light uh, as a result of living in the UK, um, unfortunately, which is yeah. uh, why we should all be prescribed yeah. holidays. Um, vitamin C is really interesting because... <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I, I was going to, it was literally the next thing I was going to ask you about actually, as it pertains to, uh, collagen production, w w is there a particular dose that you're a fan of for a sort of like entry level, uh, or maybe a high dose, uh, if someone does have like raging gum disease or, or, um, or recessions. So we do a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, um, and that's kind of been, I prefer either the spray or a pill form. Um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the effervescent tablets, just because they're fizzy and they've got sugar in them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so that, that's my, my general um, one. Another thing which some patients I do is liposomal glutathione as well. Um, and mm -hmm. that's again, just a really strong antioxidant and it helps with general oxidative stress. Um, but it's also, it's in, because it's something that you pump into your mouth. So we, we ask patients to do two pumps a day. So they, they do two pumps. I actually get them to swill around with it and then they swallow it. And that again, um, has been quite beneficial for patients too. That's super interesting. Okay. So I've got my supplement stack here that I'm, uh, putting, <laughs> uh, putting out. So I, I've ticked off a couple, um, since you told me to do CoQ10 started that vitamin C, I feel like I'm adequate cause I have a very green diet, but you know, you probably could do with just topping myself up on days that I don't get my, um, my 10 a day. Uh, and then the K2 and D3 I've been taking as well. So specifically MK7 um, uh, as the version of uh, vitamin K2 that's usually combined in vitamin D3 preparations these days because of the calcium recycling um, uh, requirements that you need when, whenever you're taking vitamin D3. Um, and uh, the dose I'm using is a, a thousand uh, IU which I think depending on, you have to titrate this, uh, I guess, to, to, to where your patients are in terms of how deficient they are. I think 1000 is probably like a, a, a base requirement. Uh, I know in the UK, yeah. our government guidelines are like 400 IU, but I, uh, the reference ranges are quite low in my opinion, like 25, yeah. um, uh, which is yeah. a low reference. I'm assuming you're using a high reference range or yeah, so we actually use the German um, reference ranges, um, or also there's like, I, I can't remember, but I think the there's like a functional um, reference range, which is actually where your level of vitamin D should be to have um, kind of more uh, healing effects, if you want to call it. It's not just like the bare minimum to live. It's actually yeah. the when you start feeling the benefits. So, um, and the German and the, the functional medicine ones are pretty much the same. So we use those and then, yeah, we calculate how much vitamin D you would need based on how much you have currently. But I agree with you. I think a thousand IU is, is kind of like a, a minimum for me. I, I use patches a lot. So I use like these transdermal patches that you just put on your stomach and it's got a 5,000 IU. And so mm. sometimes I use that like once a week or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. Do you, do you know the reference ranges for the Germans uh, off off hand or? Uh, not off the top of my. It's all right. Head. I'll put it in the show notes. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it in okay. the show notes. That's all good. Um, and yeah. in terms of, uh, uh, so we've gone through a whole bunch of different supplements there, which I think are super interesting. 
Um, are there any other like more quote unquote natural remedies for recessions? Uh, if I ask my mom or anyone in my family, they'll reel them off. But uh, I want to ask you <laughs> and your professional opinion. Uh, uh, have you come across any any more natural remedies for for, for recessions? I actually haven't. The only thing I've seen some patients do is they get a CoQ10 tablet and they cut it in half and they put the, the inside of the tablet or the supplement on their gums and they say it works perfectly. Um, huh. But apart from that, yeah, which I mean, I, I, I'm not recommending anyone to do, but I yeah, can yeah. see why they would do it. Um, but apart from that, honestly, I wish I could say that I've got some, but there's not been anything that I know of or have heard of. Well, actually, um, again, more with like the diet side of things because is um, Manuka honey um, and oh. propolis. So, yeah, oh. so um, not don't don't rub the honey on your gums or anything like that. Um, <laughs> more just having um, a min. No, um, having a just a kind of like a teaspoon of Manuka honey a day. Um, has been shown to be very antibacterial and particularly against Porphyrmonas gingivalis. And we all know Porphyrmonas gingivalis is the one that we don't want. Um, and on, if you want to go one step further, propolis is the best. So propolis is basically, it's, it's the pollen, but it's kind of the unrefined version essentially. And you can you get a propolis spray. Um, you can even get the propolis itself to eat, but it tastes pretty gross. Um, so you can just use the spray and again, spray it in your cheeks or on your gums as well. And that just uh, apparently helps, but I, I can't, you know, there's not been any research to show it. This is just what some people have told me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that, that, I mean, yeah, as, as long as people aren't going to be like rubbing this stuff on their gums, cause it is sugar guys. So yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely <laughs> yeah, not please. advised. No. To, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just did a little bit of uh, looking up actually on um, the reference ranges that the Germans um, uh, say, and I, I can't find. I think the uh, the, the safe upper limit um, is two thousand IU, um, but actually there's a, an organization uh, called the German Nutrition Society, and they they state it should be like four thousand IU per day. Um, so I know that th there's a bit of discrepancy there, but we'll, we'll find that and we'll put it in the show notes for sure. Um, yeah, I, cool. I know okay. the reference limit for, so I know that, um, what I do know, like, which I'll tell you afterwards, which I just can't remember it is the actual reference of how much vitamin D is, um, like how much you currently have and how much you should have as a, like, I, I wouldn't know on a daily supplementation thing, cause I think that needs to be calculated per patient but what we yeah. do i think uh, is like 80 i eighty thousand, for example and then we like calculate how quickly it could get you to get there but i'll send you the calculation and also um our references for that yeah yeah for sure um cool okay let's um let's turn our attention to uh me uh, so we did a whole bunch of tests, uh, including uh, the collagen breakdown test. So may maybe you can walk us through that because that's an in-clinic test, isn't it? Yeah, so it's point of care. So you get the results after 10 minutes. Um, and basically what it's looking at is an enzyme called AMMPH, and that stands for activated matrix metalloproteinase 8 um, and that is an enzyme which is um, it causes collagen breakdown and particularly the collagen that your gums are made out of so if you have high levels of amnp8 in your saliva then that means that there is a lot of collagen breakdown um, and the reason that this test is very interesting and the reason that i decided to use it is because um, a lot of the time gum disease is, it's quite invisible and we don't often see gum disease until it's too late, until destruction mm. has occurred. And so this is a way of being able to flag up those patients who might be at an increased risk of recession or even just, just, you know, gum disease, but they don't have any symptoms in their mouth yet. And sometimes it can take six months for those symptoms to actually start to, to show clinically in the mouth. So by being able to flag them up earlier on, we can then be like, hey, you know, your collagen breakdown is slightly elevated. Um, I would recommend that, you know, you come maybe more regularly for a hygiene or we switch your toothpaste or whatever you need to have done to basically get that collagen breakdown level low again. 
And the beauty of it is that we can retest. So um, most patients, we, we do the same test on them every time they have a hygiene, for example. And then if their levels um, become less than 10, which basically means undetectable, then we're like, great, you're stabilized. You can go back to maybe coming every four months or every six months for your hygiene. Um, and, you know, phew, like crisis averted. <laughs> we're out of the gum disease era, like area. Um, so, yeah, so that's a, it's a really good test. Yeah. And, and in mine, uh, I can't remember now, but w was it elevated? You have permission have to your, share your my test. data. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. I, I think I remember it being slightly high. Yeah. Um, it was, where is it? Because I remember seeing yeah so yours were yours were high um it, it's a spectrum so um less than 10 is obviously undetectable then you've got 10 to 20 which is like eh, a little bit 20 to 50 is like you've got gum disease 50 and above is like you've got gum disease and you probably have some sort of general disease or systemic problem that you're also fighting mm -hmm. people who have like rheumatoid arthritis or you know they're in the middle of chemotherapy or something like that they often have like off the charts levels. Um, and then again, in those cases, it's quite nice because you can flag those patients up and be like, hey, I think you should maybe see your doctor because these levels mm. aren't going down and you have no problems in your mouth. Um, so yeah, so yours were yours were in the 10 to 20 range. So you just had a little bit of gum, uh, kind of inflammation or some sort of collagen breakdown, but it wasn't anything too dangerous. Okay. And w with the stack of things that I could be doing to slow recessions, would that have an effect on that result? And is it worth repeating in, let's say, three months time? Yeah, definitely. So it would definitely be um, recommended to repeat that. And then also for a patient like you, who, you know, you are at a high risk of recession and you have a little bit of collagen breakdown currently, and because of that recession, it's more difficult for you to brush. Um, mm. I would definitely say that you should come more regularly for um, hygiene. So we do a treatment called guided biofilm therapy. And that's basically like a, um, a more kind of uh, non-invasive option for a hygiene treatment. And it's where we disrupt the biofilm. Um, we, we show all of the bacteria first, and then we remove it using an antibacterial spray. Um, and it's very gentle to the gums. And so that's, again, something that you could have done every month if you wanted to, and it wouldn't cause any damage. And it would mean that you would never get that plaque build up around those gum recession areas. Yeah, yeah, which is something I, because I, I, I hate going to see the hygienist. It's usually like a really painful experience. Uh, and I kind of put it off and then like, you know, a year's gone by and like, oh, this is worse because I should have just gone more often and just bit in the bullet. But I remember when I had um, uh, the, the hygiene session with yourself, it was a lot, and I'm not just saying this because you're my mate, but it was really uh, nice and gentle. Um, and I, I could see myself going back, you know, every two, three months or however often you recommend for me. Yay! So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is. Um... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I really do believe it. I think I feel like because, you know, I, I've done hygiene on with using lots of different instruments and stuff. And every time I'd have a patient with a uh, recession, I'd be like, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. They're going to hate me. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> and then now that we've got this machine, it's like just a dream because the water is warm. Um, we're able to remove like 70% of the plaque without even really touching your tooth because it's just like mm. a jet spray of, um, you know, of powder. So it actually is really, really good for the gums. Um, yeah. So anyone who's got recession, definitely get a guided biofilm therapy. And what, what is the uh, antimicrobial solution that's actually being sprayed? Do, do you know, what is, what is the actual um, product? Uh, it's erythritol. So uh, it's a very, very oh. fine um, uh, part. Of, like it, it's, I can't remember the microns, but it's a really, really small version of erythritol. So it's so small that you could literally spray that powder on it's powder mixed with water, but you could spray that like directly on your gums and it wouldn't make your gums bleed. Um, but it's still got a large enough particle size that it's able to 
remove the biofilm and the bacteria and plaque um, and also staining as well. And do, do, am I right in thinking we have some gum, uh, sorry, um, uh, chewing gum that's made out of the same uh, products? Uh, I think it's mainly more like xylitol and xylitol, um, okay. I, I don't know. Actually, there was erythritol chocolate that came out. I know that. But um, erythritol then had a bit of a bad rep. So um, there was a study that came out, I think, like two years ago or something or a year ago, which said that erythritol is not good for you um, and it could increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, the research is not, in my opinion, the most evidence based, but also for anyone who is worried and is listening, um, the erythritol that we're using is not being ingested at all. And it's such a mm. small particle size that it's actually completely different. It, it, it's not worth comparing to with that, the erythritol that was in the study. Okay. And I guess the consumption rates of that, if there was to be anything ingested, would be a lot lower uh, than, than, you know, uh, daily use, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think you need to be eating like a tub of erythritol and then you might have some problems, <laughs> but like yeah, having yeah. a little bit of powder, uh, they've done, the company has done a lot of research on it and they found there's absolutely no um, problems with it. So that's all good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good point to note because people get um, very sort of antsy around any suggestion that there could be uh, a negative side effect. I mean, if you look at aspartame uh, and the arguments that are raging as a result of the latest association with cancer, you know, you have to be consuming quite a lot of this product to actually have any potential yeah. negative ramifications. And I'm not saying that aspartame is uh, completely um, inert. Uh, it m most probably is not, but like just taking the precautionary principle without getting too caught up in the narrative that anything that is toxic is something that you have to completely remove from your um, surroundings. You know, we're, we're very resilient beings. So um, let's, let's talk a bit about the other tests that you you've done. So I'm, I'm nervous about, <laughs> about what you're going to tell me because I look through the results. I don't understand uh, pretty much any of it. I recognize some of the microbes <laughs> that are on the uh, on the report, uh, but I'm hoping um, you, you can uh, provide some clarity. So, what, what what is the test that you 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 did first of all? So we did an oral microbiome test on you. Um, so we were basically looking at the bacteria in your mouth. Um, and the microbiome test that we did was looking at pretty much like the top 20 bacteria, which are associated with gum disease, um, decay, but also can give indications of gut, um, problems, um, systemic inflammation. Um, and also it looks at fungi as well. So it looks at fungal infections too. Okay. And how was the test performed? So, um, we basically make you spit in a cup. Um, so you're not allowed to eat or drink anything for, um, 30 minutes before, and then we get you to spit into this cup. Um, and well, it's like a test tube, uh, and then, um, we send that off to the lab. Um, and then we analyze the, um, the saliva for all the bacteria. And then a couple of weeks later, we get basically a full panel, um, of the bacteria in your mouth. Okay. Uh, and so I'm looking at this panel right now. Uh, I see some red uh, in the ranges saying hi, which is not what I want to see. It always raises alarm bells with me. Um, I recognize some of the organisms like Enterococcus fecalis. I'm pleased to report there's none of that in my mouth. <laughs> uh, at least I don't think so anyway, when I'm looking at this. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, but, but there are a few, uh, a, a few organisms that say hi. Uh, so, so maybe, you can talk us through uh, my, my results live. Sure. Okay. Um, right. Let's start with the easy ones. So you've got high level of strep mutans and high levels okay. of lactobacillus. So uh -huh. um, what strep mutans is, is a bacteria um, which is associated with decay um, and a high sugar diet. So when you see lactobacillus and strep mutans together, that means that patient's eating a little bit too much sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I've been found out. <laughs> You're exposed. <laughs> Do you want me to stop or should I continue? <laughs> no, you can carry on. 
<laughs> this is brilliant. All the so broccoli yeah, so... that I've been showing on my Instagram for these years, it's all a ruse. He's not eating any of it. He's just having Dunkin' Donuts every day. <laughs> just underneath the broccoli. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's how I usually find out if a patient has a high sugar diet. And sometimes it depends on how... Um, if they're combined, so if you have lactobacillus alone, that means different things. If you have strep mutans alone, that's different. But yeah, so yours is a little bit of sugar, high sugar diet and potentially some decay as well. Um, Prevotella intermedia, so that is a bacteria which um, shows up in patients who have a lot of chronic inflammation. Um, and that can be localized to their mouth, but it could also be potentially general as well. Um, so it could be that you have just a tiny bit of inflammation and your level is not that high. Like I know it says it's high, but it's, it's not. So um, you're, you're actually, I wouldn't be too concerned by that. But usually patients okay. who have high levels of collagen breakdown will have high levels of Prevotella intermedia. And it's because you've got some sort of inflammation. You've got maybe some gum disease or something going on. Um, then if we go into... Ah, this one's interesting. Okay, so you you've got your red com. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you've got your That's red right. complex pathogens. <laughs> red I'm complex pathogens. Uh, okay, yeah. Yes. So these are basically the bacteria which are the worst in the mouth, um, and they're the most pathogenic against, particularly for gum disease. So if you have high levels of these red uh, pathogens, that means most likely you have some sort of gum disease. Or it could be that you had gum disease in the past and that gum disease, the, the bacteria is still there. Right. So um, in yours, you have ever so slightly um, high levels of Tanarella prosythia. And again, I would disregard it. I mean, you want zero and you're at mm -hmm. 0.3. So I'm not worried about that. Um, and what is Tanarella again? Tanarella Pacythia, it's one of the red complex bacteria. So that's to do with gum disease. Oh, okay, fine. So the, it's just uh, an organism. Because uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't come across that before. But that's, that's yeah, it's a new word for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's just, a, yeah, because it's mainly it's always in the mouth and it's just to do with gum disease. Um, gotcha. And then the only, the other one that you had is um, actinomycetol. I can never pronounce it, but AA. I mean, it's a really um, long name. It's like it. twenty letters in that in that. I see. Yeah. Actinomycetes. Actinomycetes comatans. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, um, AKA we we call it AA is what I call it, and um, oh, okay. you do have slightly elevated levels of that. So uh -huh. generally, if you had if you had um, really bad gum disease then um, and you had high levels of AA, then I would be worried that you have maybe quite an aggressive form of gum disease and it's quite fast and it's quick and um, we need to get going quite aggressively. Um, because you actually didn't have any signs of, of active gum disease in your mouth, you didn't have you know, bleeding gums or pus or anything like that, it could be that you just maybe had it in your um, in your microbiome, um, but also there's a couple of different serotypes. So you've got some uh, kind of serotypes which are actually not that bad, and then there are some serotypes which are really bad. Um, and so it could be that you actually had a not bad serotype in your microbiome, and again, it's nothing to be too worried about. So again, that's why I think it's really important for anyone who's out there who's listening that your microbiome test, a lot of people get excited and they're like, oh, I'm going to go do a microbiome test and learn all about my, my bacteria. Mm. And that's great, but it has to always be paired with a clinical examination because what you have in your mouth does not necessarily mean that you have diseases or problems and they have to all be paired with what's inside, like clinically in your mouth. Um, and it's again, because of those serotypes, it's about the combinations of the bacteria um, and what we see. Um, and then the last one, which was interesting, is you had. What, what, a, a sorry, slight... just to just just to underline that point, I think that that's a really really important uh, uh, point to make because, like you said, a lot of these tests are becoming available to consumers, and I think without the clinical input of okay, yes, that's high, 
but you don't have pus, you, your, your, your gums aren't like super inflamed, they're not bleeding, all the rest of it. It's something that you can have a measured response to. Whereas if you're just trying to do this yourself so, and, and, you know, even more so in the mouth where you can't like properly examine yourself. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted yeah. to unlearn that point. Yeah. And, and it, it is kind of frustrating. It's, it's nice that people are taking health into their own hands and I, I'm fully up for that. But at the same time, again, the mouth is something that you, you can't see your own mouth usually. And so starting to do things based on that bacteria is not recommended. So please, mm -hmm. please don't try this at home. Um, <laughs> so then the last one is um, you had um, slightly elevated levels of candida. So you have a very, very slight candidal infection in your mouth. Um, now, again, what is interesting in your case is when I looked in your mouth, you didn't show any signs of a candidal infection mm. and you don't have any symptoms of a candidal infection. You never said to me, oh, I have a sore tongue or I can't, you know, nothing like that. So again, this is another example of when someone might have high levels of something in their microbiome, but don't jump and get excited and start doing things because of it. Now, in your case, um, I basically, I, I mean, I, I think you do have candida and that combines with your high sugar diet. So it means that the candida is feeding on that sugar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> your mildly high sugar <laughs> diet, um, just once in a while on holiday. Uh, <laughs> the mouth doesn't lie. Um, the mouth does not lie. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so your, your candida might be feeding on some of that sugar. Um, and so part of your recommendations was to reduce your sugar um, input and, and to try and uh, yeah not eat so much sugar, uh, <laughs> but also um, some more kind of natural things. So I wouldn't jump and give you antifungals yet, because I think that's a bit too aggressive. Your, your levels are not that high but they're high enough that something does need to intervene before that candida is allowed to grow and cause more problems. This is so interesting. This is super interesting. Cause like, you know, if I just do something that I do with patients, which is a 24 hour recall of like what I had uh, for breakfast, lunch, dinner, what did I snack on? What did I drink? Uh, I had a little bit of ice cream yesterday. I had a little bit of healthy chocolate in the afternoon uh, by healthy, I mean like above 75%. Um, but then there's also some refined carbohydrates there that, you know, will turn to sugar in the mouth, you know, after, after chewing. Um, so, you know, it, it might not even be like what we think of as sugar, like candies and sweets and all that kind of stuff. It could also be just, you know, uh, refined carbs in, in the diet. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah I, sure. I definitely look at that. But also, I think it's it's how people eat sugar as well. So, um, for example, and I don't know if you did this, but um, let's say you had your little bit of ice cream. If you had your bowl of ice cream over an hour and you're just having like a spoonful every five minutes, that's much worse than if you were to just have it all in one go. And it's more about how many sugar attacks you have a day as opposed to the quantity of the sugar. Um, so generally, I always recommend that, you know, if you're going to have your bag of M&Ms, eat them all in one go, and then, <laughs> you know, rinse with water and call it a day. It's probably not what you recommend, but um, I would prefer that than someone who has two M&Ms every 10 minutes for the, you know, and they're just grazing and they're like a squirrel all day because their mm. saliva in their mouth can never, ever um, relax and get back to a healthy state. That's super interesting. Yeah. And in terms of like some of the other bugs, I, I can't remember, did we talk about Capnocytophaga gingivalis that also was high on, on my, um, no, uh, no, we didn't. So interestingly, this is again, something that I'm seeing a lot with recession patients, um, such as yourself, but also some gum disease as well. So this is more of a bacteria for gum disease. And it's not to be mistaken with Porphyromonas gingivalis, which some people get worried. You know, oh, I've got one of the gingivales in my mouth, but it's it's different. Yeah. Okay, so that's <laughs> another association. And and in terms of like some of the other bugs that I don't have, um, are, yes. what do they show? Like, uh, are, are there ones that you're specifically looking out for for particular disease states? 
So um, some of them, so like Campylobacter erectus is something that you don't really, you shouldn't really be finding in your mouth. So that's something that maybe uh -huh. a patient has some sort of gut problems. Um, and um, some of the other ones are again to do with, um, with gum disease, but varying levels of gum disease. Um, and again, I think it's really, it's mainly to do with the combinations of the bacteria. So it's, it's um, if you have high levels of, for example, all four of those red complex pathogens and you've mm. got gum disease that I can see in your mouth, then that's going to mean um, maybe potentially antibiotics. It might mean that we're super aggressive because the bacteria in your mouth is very stubborn and not easy to get rid of. Um, so yeah, and then we we also so we're actually going to hopefully be changing this panel anyway so we're going to be adding a few more in there which are going to be indicators of more of a healthy microbiome because oh. it's not always about the bad bugs but it's also about your diversity and um and essentially the balance of good and bad bacteria yeah okay well when i repeat this and i go on a strict low sugar diet should are you <laughs> a, how long between <laughs> how long between uh the the test should i leave it or should a typical person leave it and uh b when is that test available because i'd love to sh show you some good marks as well as the the bad marks <laughs> um okay so the generally i would recommend six months um between microbiome tests and that is um with you having done two guided biofilm therapy treatments um, between that. Mm, so for a okay. patient like you, I would ask for you to come back for that hygiene treatment that I would do for you um, twice. And then maybe um, a few weeks after the second time, then we would get you to do another microbiome test and see whether things have changed. Um, in terms of when the new test is out, it's taking a long time. So um, everything's a bit of a nightmare when you get into the medical diagnostic side of things but um hopefully soon okay that's great to know and i think you know just uh, uh as we're talking about organisms and bugs and fungi and all this kind of stuff in the mouth the natural inclination for someone listening to this might be to grab a bottle of listerine and ensure that they're nuking everything in their mouth that could be uh, you know, causing a problem. And I can see you shaking your head there for anyone that's not watching on YouTube. Um, tell us about mouthwash and uh, why people uh, should not be using mouthwash. So um, mouthwash is basically, a, I mean, usually it's more of like an antibacterial uh, nuke. It kind of just kills all of the bacteria in your mouth. Um, some mouthwashes have alcohol in them, which, um, can actually damage the mucosa. So all of the cells inside your mouth as well. Um, so definitely always avoid alcohol mouthwashes. Um, so I generally, I, I actually really like mouthwashes, but it has to be personalized and specific to the patient. So okay. that's what I think a lot of people don't, um, realizes and like you said they run and they go get the the first listerine that they can find off the shelf and they start using it and the problem with that is that you might actually be your your microbiome and your mouth might be perfectly balanced and then you're actually imbalancing it because you're starting to use mouthwash that you never needed um mm. also again a lot of them have alcohol so you don't want to be using that um i so for me i recommend specific mouthwashes to patients based on their microbiome results and what bacteria they have so that the mouthwash works for that bacteria. And often we might not even recommend any mouthwash and actually everything's great. So um, that's kind of my, my kind of thought on, on mouthwash generally. So it's not for everyone. It should be prescribed essentially by your dentist and it should be thought out. It's not just jump and go get something. And obviously we've all had bad breath before. If that happens to you, fine, go do it. But it's not, something that you're doing on a daily basis thinking this is going to improve my oral health and i'm going to be much better for this because it's not okay so with mouthwash um definitely avoid the alcohol-based ones the quite strong ones yeah. um what should yeah. someone be looking for if they are going to be using a mouthwash or does it always have to be uh prescribed by someone like yourself or a hygienist i generally would prefer people not to start using random mouthwashes. So it's not, um, 
yeah so that's my general if you really really you're dying to use a mouthwash and you really don't want to come and see one of us and and see which one's right for you um then maybe a probiotic mouthwash would be the best because you there's very little risk of you causing any harm to your microbiome mm -hmm. so i like one by in vivo um they do biome oral it's um, like a powder that you mix with water and that activates the probiotics and then you rinse with it and then you swallow it. So it's like a two in one and it helps the gut too. Um, oh, or wow. Love Biotics as well. Yeah, it's really good actually. Um, or Love Biotics and they do another probiotic mouthwash, which is great too. So those things won't cause you any harm. Um, so I prefer that than jumping at it. And another thing as well is actually um, people often will use mouthwash immediately before or after brushing their teeth which they should yeah. not be doing so you want to uh, be using your mouthwash at a separate time to brushing um generally i recommend lunchtime so keep it at your office and use it after you have your lunch um and the reason being is that your your mouthwash and brushing your teeth they kind of counter balance each other so they cancel each other out so all of that goodness that you've just spent two minutes brushing your teeth with then is all cleared out by the mouthwash and actually the chemicals sometimes in the mouthwash and the toothpaste kind of don't mesh properly together um and you're basically back at zero right okay so don't use a general mouthwash separate your mouthwashing if you do choose to mouthwash try and get prescribed and try and go for a probiotic one the antimicrobial elements in a mouthwash that you might be prescribed what what are those are those the actual probiotics that are displacing any pathogenic microbes or do they have an antimicrobial element in them as well so no they've got antimicrobial elements and that's why i don't like telling people to to use yeah. like a blanket mouthwash so you've got some um you've got things like uh sodium um hypochlorite so um we've also got chlorhexidine um we've got loads. There's lots and lots of different ones mm. that, um, chlorine dioxide, I quite like chlorine dioxide, um, loads of them. And those are all antimicrobials, which are aimed at specific bacteria. So some of them are oxidizing. So they mm. basically create and release oxygen and that kills the bacteria that hate oxygen in your mouth. Um, there are some which are really, they have very good substantivity. So they kind of can sit under the gums and around the teeth and kill the um, the bacteria over a longer amount of time. So they're all, that's why I mean, it, it, you really wanna use one that has been recommended to you because of what you need, um, rather than just jumping and getting something. That makes total sense. It's almost like you're getting prescribed an antibiotic, um, really, and that, and that it sounds like it's being used in that targeted way, particularly if you're using something like chlorhexidine um, you know, you, you, you're going to be targeting a certain, um, uh, microbe. So with regards to general dental advice, it is mouthwash part of that stack or is it just a, a proper, uh, toothpaste flossing into dental brushes, uh, if needed and obviously brushing as well with, a, uh, an appropriate toothbrush. Yeah, I, I think mouthwash is an add on. And if you if you brush well using what you just said, good toothpaste, good toothbrush, and you're flossing, and you have a good diet, um, that should be usually more than enough. I like to keep it very simple for patients, and just get them to do the basics, but really well, um, as opposed to being like, Oh, use this and that and try these. And you know, it, it shouldn't be rocket science, it should be a lot easier than I think sometimes we are made out to think it is. Brilliant. Well, on that bombshell of uh, finding out about my diet, um, uh, I'm going to leave you there. I've got I've got a ton more questions. Um, I would love to do this again, actually, uh, with my results in the next like six months or so. In the meantime, I'll have my second uh, hygiene appointment. I'm going to book in now, actually, with your um, uh, with with your staff uh and uh and yeah and get that get that sorted for the next time but that's definitely given me the motivation i needed <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> thank you so much victoria my pleasure <laughs>
Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed that video, you'll love the library of content that we have on doctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements, and lots more. Have a wonderful day.